Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, welcome to RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson, and it's a great honor to have here in our studio the mayor of RPV, Jim Knight. Thank you for being here. And of course, we invite you in to keep our residents knowing what's the latest and greatest things are happening. We have all great things in the city, right? Absolutely, and it's my pleasure to be here to share that with you and everybody else. Well, of course, the most exciting news coming out of City Hall right now is at least the fact that you have hired a new city manager, and of course, his name is Douglas Wilmore. Are you going to tell our residents all about your selection of Mr. Wilmore. Yes, well, uh, as you know, we've been through a long process with this, um, but we're trying to make the right decision here, and uh, I think he's going to be the right person for the city. He has an extensive background, not only in the private sector, but uh, quite a bit of uh, experience uh, in the public sector as city manager and um, in other aspects of uh, county work on different parts of the state here. Um, he has been through some very trying times as a city manager and, and each in each instance has, has carried that particular city forward in a positive way. Uh, he was a former city manager of El Segundo and uh, he did uh, find out that the Chevron uh, Corporation there was not paying nearly what they should be relative to other refineries in the state of California. And he felt that was, uh, he and, and the mayor at the time felt that was an unfair um, burden on the other uh, taxpayers, uh, the co corporations and so on there. So he, he asked that maybe Chevron would increase their, their tax uh, uh, revenue to the city. And uh, it, it created a whole turmoil in the city. Uh, there's some very dedicated people to Chevron. And as a result of that, uh, he was fired. Uh, but in, in the long run, that whole process went through uh, a whole maturation and eventually um, it was realized that yes, Chevron should have contributed, but they went to, the, went to the state attorney general, which made Chevron pay a lot more than even what the mayor and uh, Mr. Wilmore were asking, um, but it eventually led to a greater tax uh, increase for the um, residents there and help the burden there for the other uh, commercial properties. So uh, he had that challenge, and um, because he, he stuck to his guns of trying to run the city what he felt was appropriately, he received an ethics award from the ICMA, the International City Managers Association, uh, for, for a city manager who stuck to his guns and say, no, I think this is right. I, right. I, I, I'm not going to back down. This is the right thing to do. Uh, it turned out that, that, that indeed uh, the state attorney general said, yes, no, the city needs to be more equitable right. in what they're doing right. here. And so he got an ethics award for that. So um, he's a man who sticks by his principles, and he'll be honest and straightforward with us, I think. He went on to a bell. Right. A bell was in a total shambles. Uh, they had $200,000 in their uh, a budget, and they were $158 million in debt. I mean, they were, they were about to just fold. He went in there, turned the whole city around. Yeah, I mean, that city was rocked by scandal financially. Oh, I yeah. mean, the whole world knew about Bell. Yeah, right. So now he's coming here with that. He's turned right. it around. That's so great. people want to associate him as city manager Bell. He's post. He, he's the guy that made the city solvent and wow. turned it all around and got him in a positive a position of 200% reserves. And so he, he's been in some very challenging situations in each instance shown not just him talking about it, but shown in his actions right. that uh, he uh, can, can handle uh, difficult situations and, and make a positive influence on cities. When you, I know when you read about his background in government, his extensive background, you mentioned, you know, Bell, El Segundo, a city manager, but he came from Utah where he was the um, administrator for the county there at Salt right. Lake City, had a million people under him, a right. huge budget. Right. He is someone that you can clearly know that can get the job done and certainly takes on many challenges. And then the private sector to match. So it sounds like Absolutely. the cities are going to be in great hands. I think so. I think so. And and in talking to him, he's very straightforward. Yeah. He'll give you a straight answer. And I think I think it's going to be a very positive thing for the city. Right. I had a chance to meet him and when he came to the meeting, um, the last council meeting, and um, he said, you know, I probably shouldn't say this, but I want every resident to know I have a complete open door policy. Mm -hmm. and I'll deal with you one on one, mm -hmm. which is very 
He's absolutely he's a straight shooter. It's fantastic. Is yeah, Excellent. So, so you're excited. Looking, looks so excited. Took looking a year, forward to it. About a year to get here. It took more. a long time. We had a few hiccups along the way. Right. But no, <laughs> but, you did it right this time. I, I, think, I think we've got a, a winner here. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, we look forward to having him on board. His first meeting is the first meeting in March. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. But he's already been doing his homework. And I know he said watching city council meetings, he was already coming up to speak. Well, he was watching city council meetings before. Yeah. He was even interviewed. But yes, and he came to the city council meeting. He's actually a stop by the city hall just to say hello to people. And, and so he's already kind right. of in the process of the transition, even though he doesn't officially start until the first part right. of March. And I know I mentioned he has you know, a wife and two children, and he's within 30 miles of here, so he doesn't need to necessarily move to the community, but mm -hmm. he's close enough by, but uh, certainly. Right, no, it's definitely within community distance. Excellent. Uh, it's easy for that. And, and you never know, he's, he seems to like the community. He may end up moving here, uh, and yeah. we'll, we'll see. You know. Who wouldn't want to live here? <laughs> right. Our community's the best. Um, so as we continue talking a little bit more about the fact that we're bringing on Doug Wilmer's new city manager, what do you see as uh, his the first big issue facing him once he starts the job? Well, um, of course, he needs to get oriented as to what our city is, and what what um, uh, what the issues are with the city. But I would say probably right we're in right in the middle of a critical point with the labor negotiations with the city employees. So he needs to get up to speed on that and be on board and um, um, understand how that process is going forward. Right, and that moves me into the next uh, topic, which of course all ties into what will happen with labor negotiations um, at your first February meeting of the month. Um, you guys had looked, started the process of looking at the classification compensation mm -hmm. study, mm -hmm. that big report, and so you're getting it's helping you sort of see where, where the employees are going to be at in terms mm -hmm. of how they're classified as workers here and what maybe what they should be paid. So. Bring our residents up to speed on what that study is all about, why we need it, how it will help you as a council. Okay. Well, I, I kind of push this forward. Um, I, I think what I wanted to have was a third party neutral analysis of what is fair and reasonable compensation for our employees. And one of the, the uh, tools that's available to any council or any, any city is a, what's called a classification compensation study. And there's professionals that do this. We hired a professional. Um, <clears throat> you, 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 there's kind of three components to it. One is you need to select your comparable cities. So the cities have to be as comparable as possible to your city. The population, are they coastal, um, what, what tile they operate, how they're organized, how the organization is. So we had to kind of, we kind of came up with a list of what we think is close to, to what our city is. And then within that, then you have to determine um, what are the types of jobs and what are the responsibilities of those jobs in the city that we're going to compare to our city. And that's the classification component. And that's, you know, uh, none of this is exact science. It's almost like uh, a banker, and I'll give you an analogy, a banker looking at a loan for a single family home. Uh, and I'm not going to equivocate commodities with people, right. and don't, don't get me wrong, but I'm just trying to give you process analysis, uh, a comparison. They go out to a professional, third party professional, they compare various homes, the classifications have to be the same. You can't be comparing industrial and commercial with residential, the classifications have to be right. Then you compare the market values, and then you have to look more deeply, is, does the house have a whole ocean view? Does it, you know, all these components you have to kind of look at, and then there's a determination of what the appropriate loan is. It's, it's kind of an analogy. Okay. It's the same thing, kind of the same thing that's going on here. So uh, we get the classifications uh, so that they, they look the same uh, with our city as best as possible. Um, and then within those, those particular job descriptions and classifications, what is the compensation? And there's two columns to look at. One is just base salary. What are these people being paid right. just on a monthly basis? And then the total compensation, which now you add on to the base salary benefits. You've got retirement, you have sick leave, you have various other insurance uh, things that, that people have as benefits. So we have to break all that down and, and the, the ultimate goal of this is to try to find what is a fair and reasonable compensation for our employees as a starting point for our negotiations. Right. And that's what I want to have. I want to have a neutral place where we have a base of which we start from. Okay, yeah, because as for residents watching that meeting, of course, at first I remember there was some discussion about, okay, if you just look at, we look at compensation, um, RPV uh, seems higher, like 75 percentile, 75th percentile, but then if you take in 
benefits and maybe it shifts. Mm -hmm. It's right. going to be a challenge. Right. No, that's say. true. It's, it's, and it's not an exact science. You're yeah. not going to come up with an exact number. It's, it's, you're going to have to find a range, 5 or 10% of, you know, within a, a range. Um, and, and the 75th percentile is a, a council policy. It's, it's not something okay. that every city has. The philosophy behind that is we don't just want to have average workers. We're looking for a little bit extra compensation to, to kind of capture that special person that has that extra either educational background or experience or something that will serve our people better. Right. And that's the idea of the 75th percentile. And we've had a strong staff here and you've seen some turnover, right. but mm -hmm. you want to bring, you want to be an attractive city for people right. to work. So part of that whole process in labor negotiations is not just determining what the salaries are of the existing people. Part of the whole um, package includes how do we retain mm -hmm. our employees? How do we make sure they're not out searching another city saying, well, this is kind of an average compensation here. I'm going to get much better down the street. We want to retain them because we want to have longevity because that has a great value in and of itself is somebody that sticks with your city a long time. They understand it better. They're better. They can really serve the people better. And the other component is we want to be able to attract um, um, employees uh, uh, when we need them from, from the general marketplace. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so it's all kind of wrapped together in one, you know, one package. And at this point, even though the, since the uh, uh, City Employee Association formed a few years back and they're waiting to get this moving, overall, um, the feedback that you're getting, do, do you feel is this is a great city to work for? Is that your feeling? Yeah, I think so. I, I think, th I mean, I, I inter interact with the employees all the time and um, different levels, whether it's senior staff or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, it, those are the intangibles that are hard to put a number on. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a feeling of, I don't know what you call it, family here. There's a yeah. feeling, there's a, there's a, there's a team, team uh, work, workmanship here that goes on. It's a lovely place to be, to be working. On the other hand, uh, we have to take into account it's an expensive place to live. And so people will probably have to commute. And that's something that a factor that may not be the case in some other cities. So there's a whole balancing act that goes on with in terms of, of uh, keeping employees, high quality employees employed here. So the study itself, the uh, class comp study, you've pushed it to the next meeting or forward because uh, also with a new city manager coming mm -hmm. on board, I know uh, so Council Member Campbell wasn't able to attend the right, last meeting, so right. you just want everybody involved. Right, want everybody involved. But also um, we have some specific questions to the consultant we want to clarify with certain aspects of the class comp that were not really clear to us. And it is a complex uh, process, and so we, we, we wanted to get some clarification. So it's, that's part of why we wanted to go forward and, and continue this. Well, we'll follow up because we're going to continue this conversation, obviously, okay. down the road. Um, we're going to continue because we always talk about the latest meeting you had and what action the councils took, had taken. Um, there was a resident that's come before the Planning Commission and, and wanted to uh, put a second story on. And and then that was denied, then uh, he appealed it to the council. Mm -hmm. And the council has finally decided to uh, to allow this resident, Via Rosa, to expand his home despite some neighborhood compatibility concerns. So will you explain what happened with this particular one example of a, what a resident was trying to do and why the neighbors were upset? Yes. Um, yeah, this, he, he came before the Planning Commission and he had a proposal to add square footage to his home, including the second story. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a neighborhood that's predominantly single story, uh, smaller homes. And um, so uh, with neighborhood compatibility, um, it, it, we have that. Some cities have what's called Flor Florida area ratio. That would be a disaster for our city, for residential. Now it works fine with commercial and so on, but residential would be a disaster because then you say, um, here's the size of your lot, this is what you can build. And they'll go, every time they'll go right to the max. And you would see our neighborhoods changing dramatically, very fast with the FAR. Yeah, but they would be maxing out their lot. And they would be, and it'd be, it would be a disaster. So we have another way of controlling development called uh, neighborhood compatibility. It's, it's a whole guideline. Again, it's, it's not an exact science, but it's, it's the, the concept is to try to allow people the right to expand their homes in, in an area that was, side times have changed. I mean, a lot of the homes built here in the 1940s and 50s and so on were 1,500 square feet, less than 2,000 square feet, and then things are changing. 
Um, but on the other hand, you want to have that, that change not be so dramatic like with under FAR. So there are guidelines within the um, um, neighborhood compatibility. Some of the basic components are is, is an, an analyzing few impact. Because as obviously our city is very very important, mm -hmm. we have a tiered style of, of uh, development over the years. Um, privacy is very important. Make make sure we try to mitigate any privacy issues. And the big one, especially on this particular case, was uh, bulk and mass. You know, so he originally came to the planning commission, and it wasn't a complete unanimous vote. It was kind of a split vote on the planning commission, but it's a judgment call, and so. There was, there's a very um, concerned citizens that live in the neighborhood. I understand they, they, they have, the neighborhood's been that way for many, many years. It's kind of a simple single story um, neighborhood. There are some other bulky two stories in the neighborhood that probably would not be approved today under Prop M, but they were approved. So there's, it's a, it's a neighbor that already had some transition going, right. going on in it. Um, <clears throat> and so this particular proposal uh, was denied in the Planning Commission, was appealed to the City Council, and now it's fresh eyes looking at it. And at the initial meeting, we, we felt it was still a little bit too bulky and massive because he was taking a side yard setback that had been established with the neighborhood and expanding out into it, which made it seem a lot larger. Or was he still within city guidelines of setbacks? He could, yeah, absolutely. Right. It's just this, some of these neighborhoods, when they built these pads, they they set a larger setback to the upper home that's being built. And part of that is to protect views, and part of that is to, is to have some certain types of privacy and so on. <coughs> um, so that was the nature of this, this uh, community. So um, we said, no, that, you know, we, that's, that's pushing out too much bulk, and it's kind of you know, not along the lines of the setbacks for the neighborhood. Anyway, council did something that was a little bit different than the Planning Commission normally does. They gave very specific numbers of what they want to see coming right. back. And it's not necessarily the way the Planning Commission and works. And you know this because you were on the Planning Commission right. for eight years. Besides often, that, you have a background in real estate. Quite often this is the, your sweet spot. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I have a little background on it. Um, and we, usually the Planning Commission will not give specific square footage, but they will talk about the bulk of mass and they might say, well, this component over here, can you have it set back further here? And, you know, a more general uh, description. Anyway, the council, long story short, council gave very specific uh, uh, things. He complied with all of that. Um, and uh, but we still had to make the finding of bulk and mass. That, that's ultimately, even though we gave specific direction, uh, we had to still define that, make that finding. He did set it back. He had it. He had to cut back a bit, and the council decided that that was okay, okay. in terms of neighborhood compatibility. It's a judgment call. I understand the residents are not very happy. Um, there's nothing in the code that prohibits the second story, at all. Uh, and this is happening in neighborhoods, and it's always a close call, a judgment call, and... Um, and staff recommended it as well. Oh, well, staff so. recommended the original project. Right. And so this, is, this went from like 4,400 square feet down to 3,400 square feet or right. something. Uh, but the square footage is only one component. It's how it's put there. Right. You know, how, how does it look from a streetscape? How does, it, does it dramatically change the neighborhood? And this changes the neighborhood somewhat, but not to the point where it wasn't, it felt the council felt it wasn't compatible. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, course, a, it's a tough call. It's always teaching moments when, for any residents watching, they're deciding, well, maybe I want to expand my house and mine, my neighborhood, and they watch like a case like this. Uh, you mentioned Prop M. Explain how that, what the intention is of that and how that so yeah, well, Prop N is, is a discussion. neighborhood compatibility right. component. And like I say, the FAR would not work as well for our neighborhoods. And there are certain findings that have to be made. There are certain guidelines. They, they show you actual physical example. I mean, they draw out you know, what looks like neighborhood compatibility, what doesn't. We don't want just boxes going up. Mm -hmm. uh, other cities up the coast, uh, Manhattan Beach comes to mind, where you have just kind of you know, this, this complete total lot coverage and so on. We want to have a certain amount of open space and a certain amount of setback, and you know. It's, right, and I knew in this case because the term mansionization was being used uh, a lot, and I always thought, what is actually the definition of a mansion? Because I think the house was under 3,600. I don't know what actually yeah, I think defines it was one. 34 or something. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Uh -huh. So, but you. Well, it's, it's relative, and that's what it is. It's relative. You know, if you went down to some of the neighborhoods, uh, what we see along PV Drive South, and up along the hill there above Trump, and so mm -hmm. on. 
you know, those are 7,500, 10,000 square right. feet. And so if you had a 3,400 square foot home proposed there, it was like, you're not compatible. You make, need to make it bigger. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> so you know, it, it's relative. We, we try to make it relative to the surrounding neighborhood. Right. And that's that's right. the concept of, of uh, neighborhood compatibility. Well, I know you spent, they all spent a lot of time working through it. So hopefully everyone down the road will see this as a win-win. I hope so, and, and, I, and I understand the neighborhoods, the, the, some of the neighbors will not be satisfied and be very upset, and I, 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 I empathize, empathize with them, but uh, we do have a process in place, mm -hmm. it's called Prop M, and I felt that the uh, council followed the guidelines. Great. All right, um, moving on to uh, talk about, um, I know in January you went to Sacramento with the council <coughs> members, mm -hmm. yeah. and what was that trip about, what were you able to accomplish? That, that is kind of sponsored by the California Contract Studies Association, and uh, it's an opportunity for us to meet with our legislators in Sacramento and discuss issues that would affect our local cities. And um, uh, we had a great opportunity to meet with our two new representatives, Ben Allen and David uh, Hadley, and we, we had a good opportunity to discuss with them some of our local issues down here um, that we wanted to um, get their feedback on and hopefully get some support on from them. So it's like a like a one day, you know, day and a half trip thing. We go up there and do right. that. Was, and, uh, did you find like a lot of the cities had sort of the same issues that they were, you know, talking to Sacramento about? Yeah, well, it, well, it depends. Us. I mean, we have the whole state of California that's that yeah. has diff different cities have different issues. But the, for the South Bay, yeah, we have similar issues. Yeah, uh, what South were some Bay. of the what were some of the key things? Well, the big ones about? is this new MS4 permitting coming down. Uh, the, the MS4 permitting has to do stormwater quality. And the whole game has changed. Um, it's much more stringent. It has uh, what I would call draconian um, uh, regulations. And it's a very, very complex system. It starts with the Clean Water Act of the federal government that goes down to the State Water Quality Control Board, which turns around and says the local LA County Quality Control Board. You know, and, and in the interim, you have the EPA involved, and then you have environmental groups that have certain uh, cases they've won in the courts. And you got all these components that you're trying to uh, come to a end result that uh, has clean water, but that cities can afford to implement. Mm -hmm. The way it's currently laid out, it's going to cost billions of dollars to, to try to comply. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> We, the, one of the new standards is that we have to have water quality for what's called a receiving body of water. It wasn't that way before. Receiving body of, body of water is kind of like your fish tank. If you put tap water in your fish tank, you probably could kill your fish. And that, that would be a violation of the Water Quality Act. So we can't even have tap water go into our storm drains. And, and there, there, there are certain aspects that we have volcanic activity on the hill. Mm -hmm. We have sulfur that gets converted by bacteria to, to hydrogen sulfide, an acid. We have zinc. We have copper. That's all part of our natural elements that are draining down to the, um, these, these points where they're being monitored. We need to find a way that's reasonable and rational of, of the best management practices that we can use and have an iterative process where if we implement something and try to control water quality but we're in exceedance at the monitoring point, give us a chance to go right. back and figure it out. If, what, how can we adjust this, you know, instead of just saying $10,000 a day, every day until you fix this. All right. You know, it's, it's a system that needs to be re-looked at. I understand the environmental groups. They, they, they previously, they, there was cell pollution happening, and there was, things weren't happening. Cities weren't coming on board. I understand that. But um, we need to have a process that cities can afford to do and, and reach that goal. And it may not be tomorrow, but we need to reach that goal ultimately. And there's a lot of progress to be made in, this, in, in the whole county area. Good. So when you walk, when you came back from Sacramento, you felt like you're going in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, the MS4 is something that is um, with the with the leaders that they need to take certain. Uh, they need to help out in certain areas. They, they can't tell the State Water Quality Control Board what the, the qualifications are, but they need to have them look into these issues mm -hmm. raised by the city in terms of affordability of how we can implement this thing. It's one of the many issues you probably got to talk about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for going up there. Um, now we'll bring you back here to Regent Palace Party's very exciting news conference. We were all there with the council. And um, 
And that fact, at Donald Trump, he came to town, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, as always, it seems like he makes headlines, right, wherever he goes, and he did <laughs> right. this time once again because of the fact that he uh, made a great announcement that he has decided to uh, give a, um, a conservation easement to the Palace Forest Peninsula Land Conservancy mm -hmm. for the driving range, mm -hmm. and what that means, he's given up basically the opportunity in perpetuity, right, to develop that range ever, mm -hmm. if he had ever wanted to, with houses there. So mm -hmm. it's all open space, mm -hmm. good stuff, and you were there. What did you think? Well, I think it's great. Um, you know, um, as, as a developer, you have a choice of what you want to do with your land. Right. And uh, he made a choice to have a conservation easement uh, on this land. And uh, that, I, I, I gave him, I, I told Donald, I said, look, you know, you are in line now with the philosophy and the sentiments of our residents, which is we're trying to preserve as much open space as possible um, in the city to preserve a certain quality of life. And you, you've shown that you're in line with that. Now, obviously, as a developer, he's going to get a big tax write-off on this. Right. And there are certain benefits to him and so on. Um, and actually, in terms of being able to develop homes, he would have had to go back and change his conditional use permit and would have had to go to the Coastal Commission again. So it wasn't just a slam dunk for him. I mean, right. you know, in other words, he had to go overcome some hurdles. But by doing it, I think he just kind of said, look, you know, I want to be in line with the, the people in the community and, um, and do this for them. And so um, and I, I gave him, yeah. uh, you know, congratulations on that. It, yeah, and of course, having a golf course of the caliber that he has, he would keep a driving range, I would think. Oh, yeah. No, he, they, nice. they told, they, and long ago, they, they told us when they were saying they wanted to develop homes there, uh, they told us, we need to have a driving range. This is a world-class golf course. You need to have a driving range. I mean, so right. it's, it's, it's an important component for them, for their whole golf course there. Right. But it's nice to know that at least it will remain that way. If it ever changed hands... But that's true. It's permanent that. now. Yeah, it's so permanent. That, and there's, so there's no question. And I mean, because if Donald open. sold it to somebody else, I mean, there's always a possibility down the road right. somebody's going to go back and say, I'm going to change my CUP. I'm going to fight the Coast Commission. I'm going to get those houses on there. That's always a possibility. Because there's still pads there. I mean, he still has approval for some other homes. There's some other homes that were not part of the conservation easement that still can go in, but they're kind of down below this berm area. Right. And it's not going to be as much an issue as some of these this area where the golf range is. Well, he certainly said he's happy to be working with this council here, and yeah. this progress has been made, and, and it's an important relationship because Trump is so important to the community. It's a beautiful, beautiful yeah. place to be. So, um, yeah, he's. Uh, we, we've settled some issues over the years. Uh, the lawsuit that was happening a long time ago and had to do with geological issues and all that, and so we've finally come to settlement of that. And so. I think it's beginning to, the whole thing, relationship with Donald beginning to settle down. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was a fun day, and uh, it was great to, uh, and for the Land Conservancy, of course, a lot of excitement mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Um, of course, everything from Trump right down the coastline, Abalone Cove, you just keep going, it gets better and better, you know, We've had, and um, our, it puts our PV on the map, all of these things, you know, PVIC, it's all great. And um, one thing that was a news story just recently I read about how RPV is a place where filmmakers want to come and we're seeing mm -hmm. an increase in permits being mm -hmm. put out. What do you think of all that? I mean, some people might want to keep this a secret here, but overall. Well, you know, it's, it's <laughs> interesting you should say that. This is not different, not that much different than the neighborhood compatibility issue is that people that have lived here all their life has been kind of a sleepy little place enjoy the beauty of the coastline to ourselves and suddenly like you say we're on the map yeah. and we have all the nature trails now and we have this beautiful coastline that the film industry has discovered um, and uh, so that can change how what happens within our community and there's a great saying, I forget who said it, but you, there's a possibility of loving nature to death. In other words, you, you can have a beautiful nature point, a place, but you can have so much trampling on it and so much activity, you just kind of destroy it. Yeah. I don't think we're going to get to that point. But I mean, the point being that, yes, as we get on the map, there's going to be more activity down here. It's not going to be like it used to be years ago when it was just a private little secret down here. Um, I think it's fine. I, I, and the thing about filming is we control the permits. So. If it gets out of hand, we can say, hey, right. you know, give it a rest. It's, it's, it's under our control. Um, the, the, unlike the, the trails and so on, which we can't tell the public, uh, you know, well, we have enough public, goodbye. You know, you, you, have to, you have to get your cue, you know, to, to come use it. Filming permits, we can control that. I think it's fine. It's a good revenue source for the city. I, I went to a, um, a Contract Cities convention and talked to somebody that uh, worked for something called Film LA. 
It's a group of people trying to get more filming back in Los Angeles because it's kind of gone out right. for tax reasons and so on. And um, I got them in touch with the city. And the reason I did was not so much to increase the filming as much as to help the city process filming, because uh, they help process the filming permits. They actually will go out and give notices to neighbors and saying there's going to be a filming here at the site. And just so you know, uh, between this hour and this hour, the um, parking lot may be occupied by a staging area for the filming. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I mainly I want to get the, it, so it helps the community uh, with understanding the filming permitting. But uh, but film but film in LA I think has also uh, helped put us on the map too in that sense mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they also try to promote filming and they once they discover we have these beautiful coastlines for certain commercials or films or whatever, right. um, it get the word gets out. Oh yeah, um, I know. I've had I have had a friend call me from the East Coast and said, I think I saw an ad at that beach club. PBC is a <laughs> popular spot. Uh -huh. Isn't that that picnic area we were sitting at? Because it's in a car commercial right, right now. Exactly. It's, I have only a five second shot. But <laughs> exactly. I, <think> it's fun. <laughs> I remember going down, uh, I think it was uh, about two years ago, Johnny Depp was down there filming yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean. Right. He, was, he just said hello to everybody and my, my daughter was just like, oh my God, this is Johnny Depp, you know. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> That's good. It's, it's fun. Of course, moving on to another great asset that we talk about, we said that Monty Kovar parks are amazing. And right now the city's going through a, um, the uh, parks master plan update process mm -hmm. where they're reaching out to the community. They've done a, a dozen meetings. We're wrapping it up here in February, I think, mm -hmm. with the meetings. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, how's, what, what kind of feedback are you getting? How is that going to help the city in terms of planning the future of our parks? I think it's been good. I mean, we always want to reach out to the community uh, to, to get some idea of what they see, what they like to see uh, for the future of the city. Um, it can be a difficult process, too. I, 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 I'm sure you remember I was in the Open Space Task Force um, years ago, and it was a similar process. We were looking at our parks and trying to figure out where should we go and so on. And we had, a, I mean, you, you get a lot of diverse input, a lot of, a lot of ideas. Some of them might work, some of them might not work, um, and so you have to kind of filter through all that and mm -hmm. and, and see what, what what what's going to work. And you have to be careful about special interest groups. I mean, if somebody wants a huge field or something for one particular sport that takes up most of a park or something mm -hmm. or, or an area that may be undeveloped at the point, you have to be aware that you want to have uses that are, that, that are available to as many people as possible. So we're looking for multiple, multiple use type of components. Um, and it can be difficult. It can be difficult. And some, some become quite controversial. Uh, this gateway uh, park down here. When I say gateway, it's, it's the one that's um, right down to PB Drive South. Um, it's, it's right past uh, Klondike Canyon there. Um, there's, there's a gate, you can see the Land Conservancy sign and so on. It's like an area down there, but uh -huh. it's, it's in the landslide area. So you have that issue, you have geological issues, what you want to do with it. And the idea at one time was to have that as a parking lot for entry for, for um, uh, people to enter the preserve from below because there's such a heavy burden on the Del Cerro Homeowner Association up above on Crenshaw. And so that seemed like a reasonable idea, but then certain issues came up to play. Uh, is it safe? There's, there's landslide, there's fissures there that are wide open. Is this the right thing to do? The other thing that happened, if you remember, we had a drowning over in, um, uh, off of uh, Inspiration Point, and then we also had some work being done um, at the Emily Cove Park, so that parking lot was closed. And so we had people kind of parking over in that area but then they had to cross PB Drive South, and they didn't know where to go. And it was they were trying to get over to Abilene Cove, and there was there's really not much of a walkway there. Mm -hmm. Safety issues, things of that nature. Um, so I'm not sure where it's going to go, but we're trying to get as much input as we can. And that particular one, that's the one controversial one. The other ones are just pretty much just trying to figure out what the community would like to see in terms of recreational opportunities at the other parks. All right. Do you, just, do you see the need for more recreational opportunities? Everybody likes passive and open space and all yeah, that. Yeah, no, but there's definitely needs to be some active uh, uh, areas um, for all ages. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's moms with toddlers like to have a little playground somewhere or something, mm -hmm. and all the way up through uh, soccer and, and baseball and, and so on. So, uh, you know, there needs to be definitely an active recreational component, um, we are getting some input from people in other cities too, uh, okay. because Rancho Palos Verdes provides a lot of recreational open space for the whole hill, not only the hill, but the whole South Bay area. So um, that's a, somewhat of a burden for us, but uh, we want to 
you know, make our parks as best uh, we can for as many people as possible. It can be a good problem being popular. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you, you, it's interesting yeah. you get people from other cities saying, well, you need to do this, that, and the other in your yeah. parks, and you're kind of going, well, this is really, you Not know. Not your call. <laughs> but no, I appreciate the input, right. but we, we want to really get our own residents, uh, you know, input on that. Excellent. Yeah. And so once the uh, last uh, workshop is done in the community uh, with a the meeting, then you take all that and we'll be hearing Come up with the a master plan, and, and we can look through the master plan and fine tune it and do whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, top priority always for the city council is keeping our residents safe, and crime and safety is always up there number one. Um, I actually did a show with Captain Bullen recently. We looked at the crime stats for 2014, and overall they were down, mm -hmm. but there was an uptick in burglaries at the end of mm -hmm. 2014, and there tends to be, I know just in my own neighborhood where I live in Seaview, with, you know, neighborhood, we get the, um, you know, the, the alerts all the time, but people just feel like, you know, there's just a lot, of, lot happening. We're seeing a lot more rise in, in burglaries, and people are more nervous about their safety. What do you feel about all this and, and what we do about yeah, no, I, keeping residents feeling like this is still No, I know. And, and when you say, used to be in as far as safety. And I think you bring up a good point, keeping them feeling like they're safe. Uh, there's, there, there's, there's the factual data that we have right. from, from the, from the uh, Sheriff's Department, and then there's the perception of, of how safe do we feel. And I think we really need to address uh, both, but, it's, uh, but not forget the perception of, of how do we feel exactly. safe. That's an important component. And so, what I've tried to do with Captain Bolin is um, um, try to sit down with him, and uh, they, they already have a decent program they've already put in place. I was hoping to, to, to work with him along with the Homeowner Association, but they seem to be reaching out to Homeowner Associations already. But I want to work in conjunction with him uh, on these particular issues. And uh, the, the, if, if there's one word I can say is just awareness in your own, your own street. I mean, your community, but your own street, you know. Uh, if, if there's any kind of suspicious activities uh, or any cars sitting there don't look right, the sheriff says, call them. We'll check it out. You know, maybe it's just a family member visiting, but at least you know what it is and what it isn't. So awareness is one thing. So part of it is the education of, of the residents to understand what they can do to help the sheriffs make sure we're as safe as possible. And we are a very safe community, but I understand there's, you know, Apparently, some of the crimes go through um, cycles. cycles, but also they, 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 they find new ways of, of, of getting at you. Mm -hmm. uh, they start targeting people. They, they'll, they'll park in a street and start you know, making notes of when you're leaving and so on, those kind of things. There's, there's new techniques they always come up with. And, um, or they may be targeting certain ethnic groups for some reason. I mean, it, it just it depends on uh, what the criminals have come up with. And so we have to keep ahead of them and keep vigilant. And um, part of that is awareness and education of what you can and can't do. Um, the um, Sheriff's Department has a system whereby uh, if you go on vacation, you can let them know. It's private information just with them. Nobody else knows. And they will make an effort to just kind of drive by. Now, we have a whole volunteer program that I would like to see expanded. Right now, the volunteers are wonderful people. They're out there. They actually have patrol cars. They've been trained. The white ones. Yeah, the little white ones. Yeah, right. And they drive around. But um, I'd like to get them a little more actively involved. Um, um, I think one idea possibly, and I haven't talked to Sheriff Bullen about this yet, but uh, one idea might to have them come by with the homes that are um, on vacation just to take a walk around. Just, just to yeah. kind of just make sure you know there's no open doors in the back or anything like that. Make the residents feel like there's someone watching for mm -hmm. them. And get them more involved in that. I've used them when I've gone on vacation. Yeah, right. And so I like to kind of utilize their, their that availability better. And I know I know at the meeting at the last meeting of January, I believe Council Member Mizitich referenced just put it out there as a possibility of maybe. Um, having more volunteers and patrol cars out there could be a lot cheaper than say bringing a full black and white car. And, yeah, that's true. And that's being something that is you guys, are you working on that one? Yes, yeah. yeah we're, we're I know he brought that up at the end of the meeting. We're looking into that, but I did talk to uh, uh, Sergeant Rosas and he said that really um, that's a great idea, that's fine, but you need to actually expand what the volunteers can do, and that's that's be, that that might be as important as just buying okay. new cars for them. So, Sounds we're in the process of working with the sheriff's department, uh, you know, and, and trying to find the best possible way of making their places even safer. Uh, and part of that is education, going out and telling residents what are the things you can do 
that deter the crime as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, for a long time, we were getting cars broken into with computers and purses in the front seat and the cars unlocked on the driveway. Hey, you know, right. come on, let's, 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 let's get, not make get the on board here. Let's for the thief <laughs> right. there. Right, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm going to be like five steps ahead. Um, you mentioned Sergeant Roses, so it's a perfect time to bring up the fact that Sergeant Dave Roses, mm -hmm. um, who, by the way, helped really implement an incredible volunteer program for Absolutely. the Sheriff's Department. Absolutely. I sat down with him, and I think when he started, it was 30 plus, and now it's over 1,000 volunteers mm -hmm. in different capacities of the Sheriff's. But he spent over 30 years mm -hmm. as um, moving up the ranks and uh, is from the community. He's retiring. He's retired, technically, at the end of this mm -hmm. month, mm -hmm. of, end of January. And also Deputy Chris Knox, also more than 30 years. So we're losing two amazing, mm -hmm. finest of uh, mm -hmm. the department over there. And um, what were your thoughts on just their contributions uh, with Deputy um, Knox, and of, who's known, of course, as the traffic mm -hmm. enforcer here. <laughs> and let, they call it the Knox factor. Right, factor. And, uh, and then Sergeant uh, Rose is also <laughs> leaving. What are, you, what are your yeah. thoughts on what they've done? Well, I, th I think they've both been ex very positive for the community. I mean, I know it's not fun to get a ticket from Officer Knox. And you <laughs> Do you know your... personally? No. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I, I, fortunately, I, I know because because he's out there, I yeah. keep my speed down and you know make sure I'm on PV Drive South. I don't get too fast, but um, ultimately, I know Chris Knox. He his ultimate goal was to make it safe for everybody, and he has a whole uh, component. He works with a nonprofit that tries to educate youth about traffic safety and 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 so on. And so I know that's really where, where his heart's at. You know, it's not just getting glorious pleasure from giving tickets. It's just making sure people, you know, are, are driving safely. Yeah, he really, really cares about that. He has right. a nonprofit out that he does work right. for that same, just to really get people to know, don't text and drive, don't drink and drive, right. you know, follow the laws yeah. of the road. So I give him great kudos for that. I mean, he's, he's great. He's, a, he's, a, he's an interesting character, you know. He, he can be very quiet at times and just kind of have a smile and so on. But uh, he's a great guy. And uh, I think he, he made a great contribution to the community, mm -hmm. and you know I'm sure who they replace will be will be good. But I mean he has definitely uh, put his stamp on the community. Yeah, I think that the Lomita Sheriff Station has been very good at making sure whoever they bring in before him it was um, Lopez that was known. Mm -hmm. I mean everybody knows the name of the guy out there, of course, right. in traffic, but they not necessarily know the name of the captain. <laughs> right, they know exactly. Knox, whatever. So yeah. I think they'll probably hopefully continue the. Traffic. Oh, I think they will. Yeah, I think yeah. And continue. and regarding Dave Roses, I mean he sort of became the face of the community. You mentioned right. that at a council meeting, you gave him a tile. That's right, that's right. And uh, he would show up at ma most of our uh, 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 council meetings, and uh, he was very much involved with the community. And uh, he's just a great guy, and he's a great personality, very casual, but, but very knowledgeable, and he, he's a straight shooter, too. I mean, he just let people know, you know, this is what the deal is, and this is, you know, if you want to prevent crime, you got to do this. This mm -hmm. is straight out. Great guy. I really enjoyed working with him. I'm kind of sorry to see him go. He's a, he's a wonderful guy to work with, but he, he kept in touch with the, with the council and uh, make sure that the sheriff and uh, department understood what, what some of our goals were and some of our needs were and some mm -hmm. of the community input we had about crime and so on. And so right. he was a wonderful uh, liaison between the sheriff Absolutely. and the city. And he accomplished many over things over the 30 years he served the community, one of the latest things I remember working with him was the fact that you set up the city, the Abalone Safety Task Force. Mm -hmm. You referenced the drowning um, mm -hmm. from last year earlier mm -hmm. in the show, and it was because of all the increased activity mm -hmm. that you had to set up this task force. The sheriff's was on it, and Dave was out there with that mobile command center right. like on the weekends, just right. making sure people were safe and not going down right. into uh, sacred code. No, area. That, that was an interesting process. Yeah, Dave was a part of that, and we we kind of we hadn't had this before. This this incident happened and that was a coalition of the city, fire and sheriff working together as one unit to coordinate to try and make it safe. Yeah. This is an issue we deal with all the time is social media can make things explode overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get something on the social media like these kids jumping off this cliff and so on and then it just you got kids down there the next right. day and you're not prepared, you're not ready for that and as a city we, we but we, we uh, jumped on top of it, got a coalition of the various uh, departments, 
And Dave was, was very was. much a part of that, and um, it just we were able to, to address it immediately. Yeah, he was really huge in just educating the community about safety down mm -hmm. there, and you know, mm -hmm. pay attention when you're told don't go down. Is a high surf advisory, and mm -hmm. he and even though we say we say told both him and Deputy Knox, this is technically it's not really a goodbye. He lives in the community of Deputy. I mean, uh, Sergeant Roses mm -hmm. does, and mm -hmm. so we'll still see him around. Him yeah, we, we will. Yeah, <laughs> although I think he's got some places in Pismo Beach he likes to go up and visit. Yeah, and he also works for the Dodgers, so. So he's over there all the time with security, so okay. yeah, so we might catch him at a baseball game. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Mary Knight, since we were talking about the great contributions of wonderful men in the community, like Dave and Chris, another amazing uh, gentleman that's done so much for the community is Bob Douglas, geologist. Um, you had him at the last council meeting uh, to give him an award. Mm -hmm. Talk about all he's done for the community. Bob has been very invaluable to the community, um, especially the geological issues. As we know, in this city, we have one of the largest landslide complexes anywhere. Uh, very complex. We have homes there and so on. Um, and Bob has been invaluable in terms of helping us, guide us through trying to do the right thing for, the, for that particular area. He's a personal friend. He's a neighbor of mine. Um, his door was always open to me. Um, I was on the uh, Abalone Cove Landslide Abatement District ACLAD uh, board with him. And uh, if there's something I didn't understand, I could go over to his house and he had all the computers and all the information and he'd sit down and patiently explain to me how pore pressure worked and how bentonite was, it had a certain cap to it and it can lift the land. It was just all this informa interesting information he had to share. He, he loved it, and he, 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 he was interested in geology, so here he was living in, in an area that had geological uh, investigations and so on, so he loved that part of it, but he loved sharing his information. But on ACLAD for the city, um, he was invaluable because when we tried to determine are the dewatering wells working, where do we drill a new dewatering well, um, and how do we monitor uh, the landslide with GPS and so on, he provided uh, scientific guidance that really made what we did very effective. He was a very valuable member of the community, very willing to share his knowledge with anybody, with his, uh, what he knew about the geology. Of course, he's a professor of geology at USC. Mm -hmm. Even though he graduated from UCLA, I'm sure he had to wear two hats at one time. I thought it was fabulous. I recognized him. He said, you know, I should be getting to the city. And we're being able to really communicate this because the geologist dream to be somewhere where there's, right. you know, an active landslide and all of that, so. Oh, he was always, <laughs> he, he was always studying, looking at, he actually had some uh, uh, graduate students do papers uh, on aspects of, of the landslide. Uh, Chris Hill did one on uh, the hydrological effects of the landslide, which is very valuable information. Mm -hmm. So he, he was able to give something to the students that could turn, give something to the city, and he just was, uh, like you say, it was his love of his life, and, and he's, he's still there working out some of the hydrological issues and geological issues uh, to this day. All right. Well, um, he uh, definitely loves the work he's done, and I want to know how you're loving the work you're doing. This is, uh, as you've been serving mayor since the beginning of the year, how's it going? It's been a lot of a lot of work. As 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 mayor, you become the focal point of taking care of a lot of issues and guiding things. Um, uh, there's not just within the city, but regionally, I get placed on uh, various advisory committees and boards. Uh, for instance, I'm part of a selection committee for the metro. That's a forty billion dollar budget. It's a huge responsibility. Like a lot of people wanting to be on the board. Um, and I was just at an LA conference uh, for mayors with Eric Garcetti discussing some regional issues. So you do get a lot more work rather than just a council member and a lot more responsibility. Oh, we're glad you're taking it on. That gives us lots to talk about as we bring you in the studio month to month. So this is going to wrap up our edition of RPV City Talk. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.
Thank you.